Bear on Bears fans, another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast coming your way. Pat the designer, Courtney Cronin in the building, answering the biggest questions from each of these draft picks. So many good questions from so many of these guys. I mean, listen, Caleb William questions seem endless at this point. When does the season start? That's all everybody's worried about. But got to talk about Caleb, Rome, Kieran, uh, Tori, and Austin Booker. All that more today's episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave a five-star review. Y'all know what to do. Courtney, have you had any rest yet? No, not yet. And it's it's coming because oh, there will be that break between rookie minicamp, which is next week, and OTAs. But I think we're all kind of chomping at the bit to – see Caleb Williams in Bears practice gear. Yes, it's going to be shorts and a t-shirt effectively uh, <laughs> a week from now, but to see what how different it looks and how it feels when the rookies all get together and then when the full squad gets together in a couple weeks with OTAs. I mean, we're so close to that happening and it's exciting. Yeah, I, I can't wait. I mean, listen, even just seeing DJ Moore and Caleb Williams working out yesterday, like in, in regular clothes, it was just like, all right, the new era has begun. These guys are starting to get some work in. You had a chance to talk with all of these guys. You've had a chance to sit down and at least be on the press conference and things with them. What's kind of been your biggest takeaway from Caleb actually getting to talk with him one-on-one -on -one throughout this entire process and now him finally being here? He has not not had an answer for every question that's been that's been asked of him, which, you know, a lot of times, you know, players are coached, and especially like guys like him who are the face of the franchise the day that they're drafted. He's 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 very polished in the way that he talks, but I I feel like when that Friday press conference happened and then he does a bunch of individual media appearances with local beat writers, with TV people. I had him on SportsCenter yeah. uh, along with Roma Dunze last week. And that's on top of the fact that he did all of that and then some after getting drafted on Thursday. It's honestly kind of remarkable and something I think that we overlook with just how – how sharp and how on he is uh, when you when you're when he's in that role. And I remember I was asking him a question, which I didn't know what you know I didn't know what I was gonna like what type of answer you're gonna get. Like I asked him just how quickly did you know the chemistry was like did the chemistry come on quickly with Roma Dunze when you guys did the workout together? And you know a typical answer could just be like yeah like we were you know putting in the work together we were doing you know we're just getting a feel for each other but when he's talking in detail about yeah. that workout and then like lobs in an anecdote about how keenan allen pointed out hey there's your deep threat with roma dunze like <laughs> the f how detail oriented he is in just describing things it's really refreshing because so often when players go from the college game to the NFL, a lot of them don't have the media training and, and he's already a polished product in that sense. So the confidence, like when he's talking about why wouldn't I come in here thinking that I'm going to be great? Why would I cower to expectations or not meet them head on? Like all of those things that he says, you know, he's like not ducking anything like that's yeah. real. And, you know, we'll see, of course, like, you know, how, circumstances end up playing it out. Like if, if they lose, is he going to have that same energy? Like that's the natural question that you have about, you know, players when they appear so great and so verbose and so like overwhelmingly uh, accommodating with details of things that you ask questions about. But I've been very impressed just to see how he's already captivated this fan base by the information he delivers and how he presents himself when he's in front of a microphone. I'll tell you what I, I and and listen. I, I think that this guy has all the talent in the world. I think that he's coming into a team that's going to be um, allow him to grow as a quarterback very very quickly in the NFL. But the thing that I love about him is it, it's a young guy that's acting like a young guy. I I don't know if I've seen a quarterback outside of like. Right, Jim McMahon, right? Jim McMahon comes in with a six pack and two of the beers are already drank on the way there. Um, but where you're just like, I, I'm just living my life. I'm excited to be here. I have so much confidence that I'm not playing the stand up at the podium, be the polished high. Welcome to the Chicago Bears. I am the face of this franchise quarterback. He seems more like, a, hey, listen, 
I'm going to have a good time. We're going to go out here and we're going to compete. We're going to go out here and win. We're going to go out here and do as, as much as we can to go get championships. But I'm going to enjoy this ride. And I think that that's something that we haven't really seen from a quarterback in the NFL, at least that I can think of, where like you're coming in with that kind of energy. You usually yeah. come in trying to put like your best business foot forward. And I, because of the expectations and the pressure that's on these guys, especially the high draft picks, to perform right away. And yeah. I think there is something that's just different about him in that sense because he has had these expectations at other points throughout his career. I just wrote a story today at ESPN.com that, you know, kind of details who Caleb is behind the Heisman Trophy, behind being the number one overall pick and going to the Chicago Bears. Like, who? what is this guy's makeup? And I think his right. makeup puts him in that spot where he can exude confidence and it doesn't come across as phony or staged. Like, that's who he is. And he's a very, like, intentional – the way that he talks about things comes across as very intentional. Hell, like – you know, we do this for a living and half the time, like there'll be, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I'm like, God, I just talked myself into a circle. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> but the way that he talks, it's really, it's honestly like really impressive uh, watching a 22 year old do that. And yeah. it's, I've had people like ask, like, you know, just how much of a departure it is from Justin Fields, not in a bad way. Justin was very guarded and, you know, he handled every media availability the same, same energy. And a lot of it was very like even keel. Like I'm not going to show much emotion. I'm not going to get too high, too low. So you couldn't tell if he was like happy or sad or what he was feeling. And of course there were moments where, you know, after wins or big, big moments in practice where you could see like that fire in him. But like with Caleb, like he wears his emotion on his sleeve and it does not take you very long to realize that. So right. when he's dropping a go bears into the the mic as he's walking off the podium and, you know, doing the bear claw thing with like, you know, the mean mug face, it's, it's, that's who he is. That's his personality. And the fact is you, he, unlike a Bryce Young or other quarterbacks who have gone into situations where it's like, holy crap, we got a lot of work to do, like straight to business, like just, you know, tunnel vision, all these things. I'm not saying Caleb won't have to do that or that's not like, I mean, who knows how the team's going to want to shelter him in ways too, but he's showing his personality and not trying to all of a sudden like change to become like, you know, the, the, perfect version of what some people believe is an NFL quarterback in the way that they come across in front of an audience. Yeah. And and I mean, listen, I, I think that you, you see that people want to gravitate to him when he does the bear claw, right? And, which, listen, I've, nobody's saying that he invented it. He didn't invent it. it. He's just making it like a thing. Invent, That's his he thing. Made it, right. Exactly. That's different. It doesn't have to be that he invented it, but now people are saying it's a thing. That's the kind of charisma that he brings. And I, and I love that energy that like, he's like, do we have a hand thing? By the way, the bears people said no. <laughs> And then he instantly does this. So let's not sit here. And I, I see this all over social media. Like, oh, we're not going to give credit to the hundreds of years of people. Like, I, let's, have, let's just breathe. The draft's over. We're supposed to like each other again. Let me ask you this, Courtney. What does it feel like Caleb's expectations are for himself in this first year? We've heard him talk a lot about, you know, wanting to wanting to win right away and mm -hmm. wanting to be successful right away. What does it seem like his expectations are for himself? In I think first he's year? done a good job. Cause like you can, you'd never want to ask questions that are going to give you a yes or no answer or a very quick, like, you know, answer that somebody can, you know, give you to like skirt a question. So like when I right. asked him, you know, when he, when he gets off the stage or gets off, you know, meeting with the commissioner and his first question from, I believe it was Molly McGrath about like, what are your goals? And he lists four things, how it's like, learn everybody's name, you know, like my teammates, my, you know, people, the support staff in the building, learn the playbook and like, you know, win games. Those are very broad goals. And so like I asked him, both him and Roman Dunze, what first year success looks like. And he went into you know, he went into those same sorts of talking points. And that's where you can tell he's been coached up to know, I'm not going to put, say, we're going to the Super Bowl the first year. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. that'd be stupid to do that. But Rome, I thought was kind of interesting when I asked him about it, like the word playoffs came came out of his mouth when he talked about what does first year success look like. And it's better to set the bar low. Like everybody would right. do this, whether you're like an athlete or something else. It's better to say, 
you know, we're going to take the next step forward or, you know, I want to, you know, win games. Well, you're not putting a number on it, but the expectations for Caleb Williams are different than most rookie quarterbacks coming in because most rookie quarterbacks are coming into a rebuild or a teardown or a situation like the bears were in two years ago when they finished with three and 14 record. They're not coming into a team that looks like this and looks so much better after free agency in the draft. And I, I've been kind of going through this exercise in my mind of what does first year success look like for someone covering the team that has a rookie quarterback, understanding that there will be ups and downs. There will be a learning curve. He's not going to come in and everything's not going to, you know, be perfect. And, you know, to CJ Stroud's 10 and seven season and a trip to the AFC playoffs mean that he didn't go through struggles last year. No, right. there will be a learning curve. It's going to look different for everybody else, but I I honestly, I look at this team and I look at the way the offense is constructed. The expectation should be a top 10 unit should be that you are pushing with Detroit to have the best offense in the NFC. And yeah, you can look at their offensive line and say it's better. You can look at their running back room and say, I I would favor that one over what the bears have. That's fine. If that's the way you're going with it, but you're in a spot now where you don't have to just accept, okay, we'll probably be third or fourth place. Okay. This offense still has a ways to go. Like you've made such drastic inst, you know, immediate upgrades in one off season to where you should be expecting to win more games than you lose. And that's like the very bare minimum for this team. But for Caleb Williams, I, I think that those are, like anything other than that would be considered not a great first year for him. Yeah, and it's going to be tough too because he's going to be judged so heavily um, b- because of the team that's in place for him, right? Because a lot of people are looking at this team and saying, "I mean, listen, you can put the 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 worst of the worst quarterback back there, and he's going to have some kind of success with this many weapons for him to work with." Okay, you're supposed to be the best. You're supposed to be generational, as everyone was dubbing him in the offseason. Okay, now go out there and show us the generational. The pressure is going to be on him. I love the way that he's handling it, though. I love the way that he's looking at everything. And he's like, listen, it, it, everybody's trying to say I don't have pressure. Like, I've never had pressure before. Yeah. I've had pressure coming off of a Heisman season. I've had pressure going into uh, uh, the playoff games, the college football playoffs. I've had pressure in high school. Um, they, there's so many t- moments where he's been able to handle the pressure. And I think that that's what, that's what I like about him because he handles it with a smile on his face and he, he doesn't change his personality based on that pressure. And yeah, he goes through the emotions of the loss, but he comes back. He's the same way with his teammates. I think the bears might have one here with Caleb Williams. And yes, I am excited to see him go out there. And I love the fact that they also added in Roma Dunes eh? that, that, at that ninth pick. I think that you have something that you can build up for a long, long time. But where does that start this season? Mm-hmm. What do you think Rome's position is starting this season? Yeah. Does he come in and he's kind of that that uh, a Z receiver? Is he going to be more? You know, what I mean, like where where do you see him sl- starting off? It's a, like the question I have for him is what is it's really for the offense, but what is his target share as a yeah. rookie? Um, if you think about last year where DJ Moore and Cole Komet were the top two, like in terms of target share for pass catchers, those two were the top two. And then there was such a considerable drop off from Justin Fields, top two weapons to everybody else. I think that that's going to even itself out pretty well here for the Chicago bears offense with Caleb Williams, which the the like there's, there's two reasons that that should be, you know, you upgraded the talent, and you 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 have a quarterback who is is an upgrade as a passer. So for right. this attack for this passing offense to take the next step, it might very well become a pass first offense, which it should. When if you have the personnel to fulfill that, and you have a quarterback who can make those throws, who is a faster processor, is better with anticipatory throws, and can throw it to the same spot or the in- the intended spot, with or without pressure in his like you know with or without pressure uh, affecting those throws, then then you know that your offense is going to take the next step. So I think for Odunze, and this is something that like, you know, came from that workout that Keenan Allen immediately recognized and told Caleb Williams, hey, there's your deep threat. Well, yeah. fortunately, he's got two of those. DJ Moore was one of the most explosive receivers uh, on on deep balls last year, on those passes that went more than 20 yards. And so is Roma Dunze. That was how in that offense at 
at Washington that had the three receivers that were immensely talented. Each of them kind of had that role, and that's one of the ones that he took on um, and made like the the strongest part of his game. So I think anywhere from like 55 to 56 targets should be on like the low end for a Roma Dunze. Like there should be, you know, DJ Moore is still probably the number one receiver. He's the X in this offense. And Keenan Allen can play a lot of different spots. Like you have defined roles though. And to see how these pieces are going to fit in place in this offense, it gives Caleb Williams a lot of options for how to attack defenses differently than being as one dimensional where even Matt Eberflew said this the other day. And I know it's not necessarily a shot at Justin, but it's, it's just the reality of, what would it look like if it's not just a five yard a five yard screen or you know like a five yard pass that DJ Moore then takes for sixty yards because right. of his speed? Like you're going to use your 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 skill player's best asset, and one of those things is how fast DJ Moore is. But what's it going to look like when you can actually stretch the field vertically because your quarterback can hit that throw and your quarterback can make that play? That's going to open up opportunities that looked a lot different in this passing game. And a Dunze like that's going to be his bread and butter this year to see the field and to, you know, start carving out like, all right, what, what is our go-to play? You and me, you mean Caleb, what is our go-to thing that is going to make us a dominant offense? It's going to be utilizing that, you know, Caleb's deep ball and the ability that Roma Dunze has in, in being on the receiving end of those plays and winning the contested catch mat, winning the contested catches, the 50 50 balls, being on the outside. He's huge. He's a massive dude. Yeah. Um, and and th- yeah. you've got to use that size advantage to your advantage if you're if you're him in the offense. How do you think it all shapes up kind of year wise? Because the one thing about Rome is he's always going to be lumped in with the two wide receivers taken ahead of him. Mm -hmm. MHJ, Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunes have been the three names that we've heard is that Mel Kuyper said basically, listen, they're all getting the same grade, but based on how the job is done, I have to rank them. So I'm going one, two, three on this. By the end of the season, how do you feel that Roma Dunes is going to stack up, especially knowing Malik Neighbors? Might have Daniel Jones throwing him the football. And and that's, you know, a lot of it depends on who your quarterback is. I think that, you know. He does not look happy. Like, think about those three teams and how the offense is. Like, who's going to have a top 10 offense there? I think the Cardinals are in a really good position to make that happen. I mean, Kyler Murray is a, yeah, they did a great draft. They did. And even last year when they set themselves up getting Paris Johnson Jr. and doing all the things they needed to basically punt on last year as a season to get back in position to then build their roster. I think that they will make a considerable jump this year. I'm not convinced about the giants, but I am convinced about the Cardinals and the bears. So by the time that this is all said and done a year from now, I think that we're looking at Roma Dunze and Marvin Harrison jr. Having, you know, seasons that are like one and two, like, but you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. is not in nearly as crowded of a, of a receiver room, which is probably no. going to be reflected in his numbers um, more than it would be in Chicago. Like DJ Moore had a career year last year. Do I expect him to have another career year this year? Probably not because of the target share, because you do have more weapons, That because you do have an offensive coordinator that wants to get his tight ends involved too. I don't think that it's going to be a bad thing because I think at the end of the day, the Bears will have a top 10 offense. But I think numbers wise reflective, it's probably going to be like, you know, Caleb will be in contention for rookie for offensive rookie of the year. And then it's probably going to be Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze. um, And then, you know, if there is like think about who had the best rookie season, offensive linemen never typically win that award. So take take away the two top 10 offensive linemen, probably another quarterback and then probably Malik Neighbors somewhere in there, too. Poor Malik neighbors. I, I'm like, what well, he said when he said, "Yeah, we texted." I was like, "You've been on the team for 48 hours. You haven't talked to your quarterback yet." <laughs> oh man, he's. I, I don't envy him, and and uh, I'm glad that the Bears are no longer that team where a random wide receiver comes to and it's like, "But who's throwing you the ball?" Uh, I thought some other interesting names on this list. One for me is uh, Kieran Amagaje. First Karan. off, Karan. 
Karan Amagaji. Okay. Yeah. I think it's, right. I don't know if it's a mega DJ or Amagaji. Like we, we will hear from him soon. And we, we got to get some clarification. We will get that. it. We will get a lesson on how <laughs> because, to. Because the one thing I do know, you cannot take anything from how they say it at the draft boy. Cause Roger be butchering the names. The fans are butchering the names. Or you get Jamal Charles up there who. Oh my God. Butchered everything else, but nailed the pronunciation of the pick that he had the Chiefs uh, take. J-Mac sent me that video, and I literally was like, bro said, I just run the football, and that's it. Y'all asking me to do too much. My my thing <laughs> about that, and like we, like we in all seriousness, like we know that Jamal Charles like has had a learning disability that he had to overcome, but there was a beautiful speech years yeah. ago where he gets up there, and he is just like just perfected it. My only issue with it, whether it was nerves, whether it was anything else, why did he keep saying Kansas City Chief? You play for this team. Chiefs. <laughs> S. Like, no. plural. No, 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 no. That's not my issue. My issue is that he didn't throw an ND or an RD or a ST on any pick. of the picks. <laughs> the three pick. <laughs> 163 pick. pick. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, I ain't gonna lie. No disrespect to Jamal Charles, amazing player, but you gotta understand that was funny. I was sitting there, I was sitting there looking at that. I was like, "Wow, this is a uh, y'all got to stop doing this to this man. Y'all keep putting him in this position." I get it, we love him, but uh, we don't need to see him up there no more. Uh, but Karan Amagaji, I'm gonna go with that right now. I think that this is a really interesting pick because I believe that he fell just because of the torn pack. He had a good couple of seasons leading up into this season where he ends up getting injured and we know that Ryan Poles is okay with taking these smaller school and not really smaller school but he's but an, not he's the an big an name FCS lineman that's what right. it is not not the big name school guys and putting them in positions to succeed Braxton Jones being one of those guys who's in there right now mm -hmm. what's the likelihood that he competes for a starting job in this first year I don't know if it'll be right away and Ryan Pohl said that um when I asked on I guess it would have been Friday night after he was drafted because you kind of hear you know not two different things like when we had Trey Coziel the co-director of player personnel come down he said that he has starting potential and yeah. then Ryan Pohl's you know, says like, I don't think he's going to be pushing Braxton Jones in year one, but I also don't want to put a ceiling on him. So there's a couple of things within all of this. We know he's medically cleared to play because of the partially torn quad, the bears doctors cleared him. Like, so that means when he gets here, he'll be ready to go. It's not a third round pick that's going to have to, you know, slow play this or like, you know, it's going to take him a while till he can see the field. So that's, that's good for creating competition early on in, in training camp. What time right. when that stuff's really going to start to come into, you know, come into the mix. But I, I think that they, you know, when you think about like length and size, three, six, five, three, 26, three, 27, he's one of those bigger offensive line. He's like the prototype of what they like size wise at offensive tackle. Absolutely. And I know that they've not been committed to Braxton Jones, like other than we think he's a starter, but we're not going to like rule out bringing in competition. Like, Darnell Wright, you know he's your starting right tackle because of how how well he played as a rookie, fighting the like, you know he went you know, fighting the rookie wall, didn't hit it at any point last year. I'm sure went through the transition process from college to the NFL, but also put himself in a really prime spot to you know be the future at that position for a long time. Braxton Jones, some of those same things that popped up year one popped up year two like you know struggling with a bull rush still struggling in his yeah. stance and pass protection those will if he struggles that's going to like open up the door for a potential change to happen now does that mean it happens right away in training camp does that mean that he loses his job in training camp no but i think it's good because you're going to have karan in there pushing somebody and eventually what the Bears, you don't use a third round pick on that if you don't expect him to be competing for a starting job at some point. Like at worst this year, he should be Larry Borum. And Larry Borum may not be on. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about like vets who are on the yeah. roster bubble, I would put Borum in there. Um, oh, yeah. When, and when, obviously, when, like you want to always have depth in the offensive line. I'm not saying that he'd like be off the team potentially if he is one of your best like eight or nine if they want to keep that money on the active roster. But, um, you know, this this could be an at the very least, this should be an upgrade at your swing tackle position. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, when Ryan Poles said it's going to be a lot harder to make this team, my mind instantly went to a lot of the guys on this offensive line, the to Terry Carters, the the yeah. uh, uh, Larry Borums, who was like, guys, you were on the team last year, not because you, you have no talent, not because you're not talented, but realistically because there weren't better options for us to upgrade at that point. And this year, we brought in some better options on the offensive line by a free agency. We brought in some new young options through the draft. We're, I'm sure you know they're going to bring in people, and they already have brought in some undrafted free agents that are going to work out as well. So it's going to be difficult to make this team. Yeah. Let me ask you this, though, Courtney. Because of the ability that Karan has to play kind of multiple positions. We know his uh, his first year in college, he did get time in at left guard as well, 669 snaps in at left guard. Is this more Braxton Jones insurance or could this be some kind of possible Tevin Jenkins insurance where we know the talent that Tevin has, mm -hmm. but unfortunately he's dealt with injury through most of his career to this point. Yeah. So I think it was right guard for him um, in 2021. I think that's where he started his career at Yale. And then remember he missed the Colt. He didn't play that 2020 season because he was, it was COVID and the right, uh, yeah. Ivy league didn't play. So like, you know, I had to remind myself, like, all right, how old is this guy? Is he a junior coming out or is he technically a senior? Because, like, his last two years were spent at left tackle. He says he's most comfortable at left tackle. It's always good to have depth and to have, you know, they'll cross-train guys. So right. if you see him at guard at any point in training camp, I think that that's just their way of doing their, doing their due diligence to make sure that they have gotten guys work at positions that, you know, you never know, like, because right. of injuries. But – I, I, they, pro they project this as him being a tackle. I don't, okay. I don't think you spend, you know, I mean, you know, see, we've seen, we see third round guards all the time. It's not saying you don't spend that pick on somebody who would be a guard. If that was a need, I could absolutely see that. But I think their bigger, bigger idea for him is that he could, you know, one day be a starting left tackle for them. All right. Well, hey, listen, I, I hope so, because that means that Tevin is very healthy next season and we pay him and I don't have to worry about anything with him except injury the next year. Uh, Tevin scares me. I, I'm, I'm worried that we're going to pay him and it's going to be like, all right, well, that's here he is now. Here's the next four years of him. And it's and it's kind of more of the same. Not that he's not talented. He's he's probably our most talented lineman, but. If my dream scenario here would be put him on the right side like we saw last year. Yeah, and he, you know, when Ryan Poles talks about some of the other extensions, like when it came up with, like, Keenan Allen um, about a month ago, like, what's the plan for that? Like, he said there's, you know, other things he had to prior has to prioritize, too, in figuring out how to pay everybody. Obviously, DJ Moore is in the mix there, but Tevin Jenkins is eligible for, like, when you think about guys you got to get done right now if you're going to yeah. do them – the injuries are a concern with Tevin. It's, it's happened every single year, but he has been their most consistent offensive lineman. So how Absolutely. do you balance that is the question. It, it's so tough, too. I, it reminds me so much of the um, – very much of the Kyle Long situation where – you looked at Kyle Long and you just knew you're like, he's the best offensive lineman on the field. Like, mm -hmm. every time he runs out there, every time he's healthy, he's the best offensive lineman on the field. But there were so many times where he was playing through the injuries. He was playing through uh, uh, something that was holding him back or he just couldn't get on the field because the injuries were too much for him. And then you're, you kind of look at it and go, man, if he just could have been healthy the entire time, what could this offensive line have been? That's kind of what I'm starting to feel with Tevin. And it, it's not to say you don't sign a guy like that. Listen, offensive line talent is tough to come by and guys get hurt. But how much do you sign them for? Yeah. Are you going to be able to find that that price point between the two of you that both sides kind of agree with? That's going to be interesting to see. Um, as we continue to move through this draft, though, the next pick is has been the interesting pick. Uh, the pick that I think most people are, are dinging the Bears for, which I don't, I don't get dinging them, I guess. The, it doesn't make sense to me because you did get a starter. But 122, <laughs> Torrey Taylor, uh, the Chicago Bears select a punter, and my favorite thing about it is Rich Eisen just like trying to <laughs> sit there and hype up the pick. Excellent job, Rich. Uh, why does this make sense, Courtney? Walk well, us through why this makes sense. From their line of thinking, you heard what Ryan Poles say, that this is not just a punter. They believe he's a weapon for them. And on the surface, you're like, what, are you going to play him at another position too? Like, no, that's not what that means. But – Oh, you could six he's four. Huge. Two, he's huge. Two, he's huge. Like he's not a he's not a normal looking punter. Um, <laughs> you make a pick like this, Trevin uh, Trenton Gill 
that his time's up. Like, I mean, yeah, and I get it. Like, you know, where he was bottom of the league and net average last year, like his biggest asset towards the end of the season was being a holder for that kicking unit that got Cairo Santos, the big extension at the end of, you know, last, you know, right around Christmas time. But you don't like stick with somebody like that just because they're a great, they're a great holder. Like right. this is somebody who, in college was the best weapon that Iowa had offensively. And I know that sounds like tongue in cheek because it's like, well, he's no, just a legit. punter. Like he outgained them. He outgained the offense by over a thousand yards. And if you can control the field position game, which the bears wasn't just special teams and like, you know, them struggling with it from the punting aspect, it was the offense too. And where they were on the field, how quickly they went three and out. And the defense then kind of having to come back in, give them extra possessions. Like, yeah, I think back to that Detroit game, the first one where they lost because yeah. of what happened, you know, you know, offense wise. And then, of course, you know, what the defense gifted to the offense, that the offense couldn't come through with. I do think that that will change this year based on the outlook for this offense. And even Caleb Williams telling him, you're not going to be punting much here. That's confidence that you won't have those same issues pop up offensively. But the field position game and just knowing like where you play the majority of your games. This is somebody who has played in cold weather games um, a lot throughout his career. Somebody who has a dynamic leg in a lot of respects yeah. to, you know, flip field position to give your team that advantage. It seems very high when you have other needs on the team to spend a fourth round pick on a punter. I get that. I think that that is a fair question about this pick but i would like to question i would like to kind of like throw my own question back in if you look at the draft order and people who were not thrilled that in the fourth round at 122 which was their last pick before they traded back in what other position within that range from 75 to 122 would have been realistic for them to go trade up and go get somebody um, at one at 75, Braylon Trice was on the, the clock, the edge rusher that the Falcons ended up taking those two, him and Tory Taylor were on the same, like when the, when the bears talk about like gold player, red player, like yeah, yeah, how yeah. they stack their board. Um, like those two were on the same playing field more or less. So they ended up going with need because their guy that they were probably eyeing for that position and Braylon Trice was gone. So if you take a look at the rest of the draft board from that time, um, you know, from 75 to 122, when you're thinking, okay, defensive line, edge rusher, there were no edges that went, uh, no. you know, you know, could they have gotten Jalex uh, Hunt, the guy from Houston Christian that the, that the Philadelphia Eagles got? Sure, but very clearly, if he wasn't on their board there at 75, like he went at 94, that's nearly 20 picks you know, later. So would they have felt that that was a reach possibly? And then in the fourth round, it was only defensive tackles that went off the board. And very clearly they're going to give Jervon Dexter and Zach Pickens the benefit of the doubt that year two, those two are going to make a big jump. And that's why when they saw Tory Taylor there and yeah, he's the best punter on the board. He's, a, you know, one of, I think four total who have gone in the fourth round since 2012 that's a that's a big that's a big swing on a position that you when you think of positional value it would have been better had they gotten an edge rusher there but I just like point out the edge rushers there really weren't yeah. any in that range that wouldn't have been necessary like a trade wouldn't have been necessary to necessitate that or it would have been a reach from them going and getting somebody they could have gotten in the fifth round which they did in Austin yeah. Booker. Yeah, and, and I think that's the thing too, right? Like the guy I would have taken there would have been Austin Booker, but he ended up continuing to slide. And as he continued to slide, the Bears said, hey, listen, we can't let this guy fall out, fall any further or somebody take him. Let's get back in and go after it. And I think that makes it more, I, I, I like the kid with the, 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 the more so the Iowa fans than anything. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's, I, my college football team is Illinois, so I'm not doing well myself. I can't beat my chest over anything. But the, the, the people who are like coming out and like, oh, there's, there's no way you could be happier with anything else. Like if we had taken Cedric Van Pran there, we'd be beating our chest the same way. If we had taken, you know, like thrown another player in there, mm -hmm. nobody would be sitting there going, oh, my God, we missed out on the punter. But I do understand the yeah. value that he brings. I do understand. And I think you said something before the pod that that I think 
really rings true about this pick. It tells you that the Bears plan on being in positions to win a lot of games, and they realize they have to have their special teams on point so that if you're in a close game, you do have a kicker that can pin somebody within the 13-yard line or within the 5-yard line and make sure that they're going to have the toughest time to go down the field and beat you versus a, a defense that now has a lot of teeth on it. So I do think that there is more of a... I think, if anything, this pick signals Ryan Pohl saying, we have enough, we Mm -hmm. need to have the extra pieces so that we know we can go out there and do what we need to do. It's not them telling you that they think they're going to go win the NFC North this year, but they feel like they're a lot closer to that in in what the roster looks like now and the moves that they made than they were, you know, before this. And... I think you can justify doing it based on like just how important the special teams unit has been for this team and what they feel like is one of their weakest links based on the fact too, with a defensive line, they got a prospect later on. They were still able to do that. Yeah. They had to give up a future fourth to do that, but you effectively got Ryan Bates from Buffalo and Austin Booker for that 144 pick that you traded and then traded to go get back. Yeah, I mean, listen, and that's that's the next guy, Austin Booker. To me, um, I, I think he is in. He's a monster. I've been high on this kid uh, for a while. I understand that he has limited snaps. I love how Lance said it yesterday. He's like, "Well, he should have fresh legs." Then <laughs> uh, I understand that he's been more of a situational guy. Mm-hmm. But when you look at the production that he's able to do, when you look at how he's been able to get to the quarterback, eight sacks in his time last year. Um, and, and yeah, like people can look at it and say, well, of course it's situational moments and it's because of the personnel that he had on the field. That's exactly what I wanted to be here. We want to go get the guy that's going to be opposite Montez sweat. If you're drafting a guy in the first round. Yeah. Eventually I want Dallas Turner or Jared verse to be the best pass rusher on this team. When you're done with the Montez sweat contract, if you don't want to resign, you've got your next guy in there. Boom. You just keep that draft process going with a fifth round pick. I want him to be the guy that is the beneficiary of Montez Sweat rushing on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at Austin Booker, to me, he may be the sleeper pick of this draft because great size, great speed, really good ability and knowing where to be to get to the quarterback. And he's already got some of the other pieces in place to make his life easier. Yeah, and he's not going to be 22 until December. So they view this as a project defensive lineman, somebody that they can mold into what they envision being a part of this pass rush. Does he come in with more of a situational role than this guy's the starting defensive end opposite Montez Sweat? Probably. But don't forget, like when you pull up their roster and like some of the other players that they have on the defensive line, I mean, there's still Demarcus Walker, who they signed to a two-year contract, and he was an effective part of that pass rush last year. That can't be discounted. Um, you know, you still have – I would imagine if they really wanted to sign Rasheem Green, they probably could. Um, you know, he was a productive member for them, like, in situational roles last year. I understand, like, the other – you know, some of these other names in here, you're like Dominique Robinson. I mean, talk about guys on the bubble this year. Uh, Khal- uh, Khalid Kareem – was there, uh, yeah. you know, Byron Coward. I'm looking at this roster thinking, okay, these aren't great names right now, but you also have the opportunity if you want to go get a unique in Gakwe again. And I do think that they will try yep. to prioritize bringing him back uh, to be part of this team because from what we're hearing, it sounds like he's going to be healthy for training camp, which is a good sign. But, and you only had such a small sample size, but like when he and – when he and uh, Montez Sweat were together last year, like you could start to see, okay, it was coming on. It, like the production was starting to come on until then he gets hurt in that game against Detroit in the fourth quarter and we don't see him again. But I I think what that all means for Austin Booker is that you're not going to be asking a rookie who declared early, who has shown a lot of potential and upside, who is a more natural 43 defensive end than he is an outside linebacker where he played the majority of his snaps last year. Like. No. But think about how much production he turned out from not even being a starter. He started one game and he had eight sacks and 12 tackles for loss. Like those are numbers that the bears look at and they're like, okay, like, you know, that's, those are things that we can work with to then see this guy's full potential through. And and I think 
taking a chance on him going back into the fifth round to go get him. I know it's a pick that a lot of draft analysts like Mel Kuyper, Jordan Reed were really high on. I, I believe that they have a good plan for him because of the resources they've added in Eric Washington being one of those guys who the defensive coordinator his pedigree is a defensive line. He'll put his, like, he'll be able to work with him from a young age to get him up to speed to where in a year or two, if that starting job, you know, is, is still, you know, if, if, he, if things are progressing for him on that track, that that could be his job eventually. But I think he'll be part of a mix right now. And if they didn't have enough draft capital going in to be able to solve all of their issues, they, they solve the biggest ones, which is why you see every draft grade, except for a couple in the A range for the Chicago bears, but they were never going to be able to. Yeah. And I mean, I I can understand it just because the punter pick does skew, you know, takes, you can look at it and say, Oh, like I, it makes me take a step back in the way that I view this draft class because that's a reach. Like you can think that you can justify it. Like there's always a case for either side, but they still did come away with an rusher, and they still have an opportunity to go add to that position in free agency, which I, I believe that they will do. And I thought, I think that point, you brought up something very, very interesting that I think also helps him. By the way, this episode brought to you by the Hard Rock Casino, Northern Indiana, Las Vegas style gaming, just 30 minutes from Soldier Field, exit six, right off of I-80, 94. Make sure to tap in with them. The one thing that really excites me about this is, again, when you look at this entire draft, you don't have guys walking in to, hey, you have to be the answer. Like, if you're not good, we're bad at that position. The opportunity to re-sign Yannick Ngakwe, and maybe you get him in here at a similar deal and maybe a little bit less because Mm -hmm. he's coming off injury one way or the other. I think that now having two guys on your team, if you do end up doing something like that where you have Montez Sweat and Yannick Ngakwe is a massive benefit to Austin Booker because if he comes in and he's more of just the pass rush guy that we saw kind of in college because those are the snaps he was thrown in on most of the time, Mm -hmm. guess what? He's got a guy in Yannick Ngakwe that's been elite at it every time he's had somebody opposite him who's been dominant. And he's got a he's got a uh, uh, um Austin Booker has a a bigger build as well. I believe 6'4, 245 mm-hmm. for him coming into this. So it's also I'm gonna be able to add size and kind of get to that unique range, possibly, right? Or if he's right, he was pretty good in in uh grading out as a, a run defender as well. If he takes more from Montez Sweat, there's still somebody for him to learn from on the field, is my point, at every turn. And I think that that's why you want to go out and re-sign a guy like Yannick. That's why you want to go out and continue to add edge depth so that this guy just has so many options to learn from because, like you said, he's got the build. He's got the mindset. Can you turn him into, though, an every-down pass rusher versus just being a situational guy? Yeah, and that's – does it happen – like for, for fifth round picks, I mean, at least not recently for the Bears because they're looking at the Dominique Robinson. People can look at the <laughs> Dominique Robinson thing and say, well, that just didn't really work out. Yeah. But I the upside here is different and the pedigree is different for Austin Booker. And clearly they wouldn't have traded back into the fifth round, even though it's only giving up a fourth round pick next year and they have multiple picks at their disposal. I don't think they do that if they feel that that would be – you know, uh, something that just like would have no potential of working out. Plus, don't forget, this is a team that's been very active at the trade deadline. If they feel that they're in like not just in the hunt, but want to go for it and go to try to, you know, continue to, you know, push and add to this roster because they think they're in contention this year, then they'll probably do something in November to add to the pass rush even more. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we know Ryan Poles is not afraid to do that mm-hmm. at all. They've got a full slate of picks still at their disposal, even after giving up that fourth. Like, I, I think that that's absolutely in play. I, and listen, we've got multiple second round picks. We know he likes getting rid of second rounders. I don't know what his beef with the second round was. If somebody well, he gets he gets good players out of it. I mean, with Montez Sweat coming in, that's basically your second round pick for this year's draft class. Oh, yeah. Well, listen, he won for two. He's one for two, and 50% is good in the NFL. It's one of the few places where if you get a 50%, you're doing all right. It's, but uh, at first, that one, that one was rough. Uh, what's he doing nowadays? He's still in the league? I, th- I mean, he was with Miami. That's where he finished up his season last year. And for those of you who for, who forget who we're talking about, it's Chase Claypool. Chase Claypool. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I he was traded to Miami. He still had time left on his contract. I would imagine that's where he'll, you know, pick up this year. But who knows if if he'll stick? Ugh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so glad he's not here. I should. I had a had a flashback on that. That's that is my. Uh, let's hope. Let's hope Austin Booker doesn't bite me like the Chase Claypool prediction <laughs> did. Because that is the that is by far the worst. That and Javon Carter. Those are the two worst predictions that I've had as far as sports talk breakdown, probably in my full career to this point. Uh, speaking of uh, basketball and some bad basketball, uh, the playoffs are here, Courtney. I yep. think that uh, we got we got to get some NBA thoughts from Courtney. I love hearing Courtney talk NBA. It's one of my favorite things to tune into on Around the Horn because, uh, listen, when when you go at guys, like you go at them. And uh, I got to hear you go at this Lakers team and whatever the heck we just saw finish out. How are you up in every, every game. single game? And you find a way to lose. I get Jokic is Jokic. Fully understand it. Should be the three-time MVP. May not get it because of voters fatigue. But you got to kind of look at what's going on in L.A. And it, for, first things first, Darvin Ham can't be coming back, right? I think that the coaching change is probably going to happen. Like, that's probably going to be the first thing that we see. And, you know, it's... It's not all him. I think the roster construction here, but they went out and like paid guys last year. They paid Spencer Dinwiddie, like, you know, D'Angelo Russell's there, like guys who like were supposed to come through and didn't yeah. like, come on, what are you doing? If, if you're thinking about like, was this the best allocation of resources after they struck gold? I want to say with what they did at the trade deadline last year to get themselves in position to go after the Western conference finals where they, ran into uh, a Denver team that's probably going to end up repeating this year after winning it last year. No one showed up. Like, outside of LeBron James, who we know, in the in elimination games, there's nobody better. He leads the league in scoring in elimination games. That's why this thing went to a five-game so series five regardless. Million. You can't really blame Anthony Davis this time around. There's no real scapegoat there of, like, oh, like, he wasn't available. Like, no. Like, that's not that's not a valid excuse this time. And even for LeBron, too. Like, you can't. This roster was so top heavy, and it has been in the support structure that was around LeBron and AD this year. Just did not, you know, D'Angelo Russell went scoreless in game three. And yeah, he had a nice bounce back game with 21 points in game four, but the lack of consistency there is just baffling. And I don't know, is he going to opt into his final year of his contract in July or whatever? He's going where his kid is is yeah. going to be able to play. And if that's Los Angeles, I think Los Angeles at this point should be like, we're not mortgaging the future for one more year of this when it's probably not even going to be likely that we win a title anyways. Get to the playoffs, cool. But like, are you are you raising banners for the first round? No, you're not. So I I will be, this will be a very active free agency period. It's going to be a very active off season. Let's start seeing the Knicks fodder. And I like, you know, the underrated oh, yeah. team would be Dallas. I mean, Dallas has won with aging superstars before. They did it with Dirk. Like, it's true. you know, so we'll see if that, like, I'm really curious to see the places that are willing to use a draft pick on Bronny and to make it happen with LeBron to basically let him play out the final year at his terms. Um, but I, it's disappointing. It's disappointing for them that it happened this way. And I think it's kind of disappointing for, you know, watching how those games went. They were up at every single game at halftime. They lost yesterday by two. But there yeah. was that moment. I mean, Jamal Murray's cooking dudes. Like, I don't, I don't know what you expect. Like, if <laughs> if you if you go all in to defend Jokic and try to stop Jokic or limit him, you'll never be able to stop him. Then Jamal Murray's gonna kick your ass. And if you go the other way, then them then like you know, three time MVP, like go ahead and give him the award, uh, is gonna end up doing what he's done to so many teams along the way. I guess the I've, silver lining is I'm excited to see what the Nuggets and Timberwolves series looks like. Like I'm pumped about that. I'm pumped to see Anthony Edwards like it, on that stage against that team, which they actually played really well against the Nuggets in the regular season. They had the tiebreaker there. So I'm, I'm curious about how that's going to look. I'm I'm so excited because it, it, Anthony Edwards is the kind of star. He's not a superstar yet. And I have a different definition of superstar. I think you got to have some. He's getting there. He's getting there. True, but I, I mean, think Kevin Durant he, said he's his favorite player. 
Well, listen, he plays Kevin the game. He is so fun to watch, and he like brings that. Like he's dunking over KD with two oh, minutes yeah. to go in Game Four. Like holy shit! Like I loved I, every I, minute I of love that. It. And I, I love the I love the attitude that he has. And listen, I know people aren't gonna like this, and I'm not saying that he is him. But when I watch him move, when I watch how he attacks, when I watch how he approaches the game, it is very Jordan and Kobe like. We have not seen a guy who goes about his game this way, even when how he talks in the post-game press conferences and they're like, Cat's like, he's the face of the league. He's like, nah, listen, I'm just trying to win games. I'm just trying to do what I do. We'll get to that when we get to that, blah, blah, blah. Like, I love that Ant has the confidence level that he does. I love how he moves. I love how he attacks the basket. I think that he is the single reason Carl Anthony Towns has not fouled out of every single game because he has been the only one sitting there going, stop fouling, dog. You got to stop fouling. Cat yeah. has been fouling out of playoff games since he got in the NBA. He's had so many low IQ moments. And I love the fact that Anthony Edwards is is – kind of galvanizing his team and kind of bringing the most out of them. And I can't wait to see what this Denver series is going to be because yeah, who's going to guard him? Michael Porter Jr.? Like Aaron Gordon? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Now, granted, Jokic is absolutely going to destroy Rudy Gobert. Um, I believe this season he averaged... Ooh, I got to look this up real quick. I, I, I want to say he averaged 30, 30 plus and 11 rebounds over him. But... Uh, yeah, it, it's not going to be fun for, uh, for for Rudy Gobert, but I think at the end of the day, when I look at the Denver-Minnesota matchup, it almost feels like this is a matchup for the next couple of seasons mm-hmm. that is going to be major back and forth. Because there have been years in the past where with Minnesota, it's like, okay, they may have gotten into the playoffs. Are they really ready for this stage? And yes, they're a young team. They're not the youngest team in the West. That belongs to the Oklahoma City Thunder. But my goodness, they have shown that they are ready for this moment so far. I mean, playoff experience, like how much I'm starting to like maybe change my tune on that a little bit. And some of that has to do with roster construction. But like when I think of that Sun series, you're supposed to be able to rely on Kevin Durant, on Devin Booker, on Bradley Beal to go get you a bucket because those guys have a lot of, I mean, not Bradley Beal, but like, you know, Kevin Durant and, and uh, Devin Booker have multiple like conference semifinals, conference finals uh, experience between them. Mike Conley is the only one who had that with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Doesn't matter. Timberwolves are not playing with any fear right now. And that's what makes them the most dangerous team in the West, I think. And I'm very eager to see them on a collision course with the Wolves. And then, if at some point we end up getting them in the Oklahoma City Thunder at the next level, obviously that would mean Denver's out, which would be a huge story, which I don't want to yeah. bury the lead on. But like, oh my God, that would be fun. I mean, listen, it, I, I would love it. I, I'm Ant's quickly becoming one of my favorite players. The biggest problem they're going to have uh, this season versus Rudy Gobert, Nikola Jokic should average 32.7, 10 rebounds and six assists. Yeah. Yeah, you you gonna have some trouble. <laughs> you have some troubles there. <laughs> the only person, and this is this is factual because they only played one time. The only person he averaged more against, I believe, is Wemby, and it's because he put up seventy on one. <laughs> so, so take that for what you will. Uh, but no, I just. I think that this is this is a pivotal NBA playoffs this year. This feels different. This They're feels like a turning guard. point. Yeah. Shea, Shea is coming up. They're, they swept their series. It feels like a changing of the guard, exactly. And I think that, I mean, listen, we've got a playoffs now where Stephen Curry, LeBron James, and Kevin Durant are all out. When's the last time we saw that? Saw them win one game between the three of them in the postseason. It's, 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 it's wild. It's a different world. I, I just hope that... You know, the the injuries that have happened, it's unfortunate. Took Zion out of the series. I was hoping that would have been better. It wasn't. Um, You know, Giannis and Dame are probably done for the rest of that series, and I would have liked to have seen them play because you know what's going to happen. There's going to be a GQ article dropping in about two months from Giannis talking about how, you know, I want to be in a place that's committed to winning. Well, Go ahead and just go to the Knicks. Like, can we stop with this? Because we do this every every off season with him. Yeah. Where it's like, am I staying in Milwaukee? Am I not staying in Milwaukee? I guess it's silver lining to Bucks fans. You won a championship in twenty twenty one. Like that's something that like a lot of teams cannot stake claim to. Like the one that we watch here in Chicago. But it's just exhausting that 
year after year with that team, injury related a lot of times with Giannis and the back injury last year. And then now with his Achilles or whatever, low calf, it's probably going to be the reason that he doesn't play. Like it'll yeah. probably be the reason that this team ends up getting bounced in the first round. And then of course there's the Embiid stuff. Um, it's, I wish that this many injuries didn't take over the playoffs and cloud the storylines. It's making way for some other cool ones. Like it's, you know, how much are we talking about the Minnesota Timberwolves? If we have these other teams at full strength, maybe, maybe not, but I'm, I'm very yeah. like, I'm very worried about like the state of like the NBA with, with this transition period, because a lot of these superstar players may be going out, like having, haven't had injuries like cost them like the last year or two of of the like of of what we could have seen from their teams because they weren't available in the playoffs. Jimmy think, Jimmy Butler's one of them too, like with Miami. I think this is just the norm though, right? Like that, load I, management is a crock of shit. It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah and yeah. that's you know I'm I'm glad that like we've gotten to the reality of that that like sitting in the regular season does not prevent like you from being injured at the most important time of the year. I, I just I think that this is how most sports goes. But because we've seen s the few players transcend it, we expect that for the masses. Right. We've seen LeBron at 39 absolutely still look like the best player on the court. Mm -hmm. We've seen Kevin Durant absolutely go out there and dominate as he's gotten older. Stephen Curry still looking amazing. The rest of his team is not, though. I think this is just how the NBA ends up going. And this is how most years have gone. Is that, is, as my daughter climbing in the back, she made it. She made it 55 minutes and 23 seconds. That's impressive. Like, Dad, we've reached the lie. NBA portion of the Chicago Bears <laughs> podcast. Wrap we've it up. the NBA portion of the show. Uh, I think that's our signal. Sit down. I think that's our signal to uh, get up out of here as I go into in-depth basketball talk on the <laughs> Chicago Bears podcast. You can thank my daughter for saving you for all the audio listeners. I do love the NBA as well. Tune in on Locked On Bulls. Uh, appreciate y'all for tuning in and showing love. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the page. Leave that five-star review. Y'all know what to do. For Courtney Cronin, I'm Pat the Designer. Back at it again. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Bear Don. Peace. <laughs>